Hello, everybody, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where uh, you happen to be sitting today. Uh, this is my HR Council's uh, first episode of our third Tuesday webinar. Um, if anybody has a better name suggestion than third Tuesday, please submit that in the chatter question box and I will send you something amazing. Um, we wanted third Thursday, but all the, the pros say that <clears throat> Tuesday is the day to uh, that more people are available. So here we are on the third Tuesday. Uh, we will be doing uh, this webinar series going forward every month on the third Tuesday at 11 o'clock Central Time. So um, hopefully that'll uh, be, I'll be able to catch as many people as possible. Um, but just so you know, this third Tuesday webinar uh, will continue being done every month on a new topic. Uh, my name is Janelle Stanton, and I am the Director of Communications here at MyHR Council. Um, what I do, I do our business development, I do marketing, um, but I also do our trainings and webinars. So I'm also a licensed attorney, so information that I give today um, definitely is still coming from, a, from me as an attorney, um, but I also do other trainings as well. So um, that's kind of a little bit about me. Um, the agenda today, obviously, we're talking about onboarding. There are always a couple of ways that you can go with onboarding. Um, there's soft skills as far as introducing somebody to your company culture, um, <clears throat> you know, getting them set up with a, a security badge so that they can get into your building. Um, I'm not covering those components today. What I'm really wanting to get at is the onboarding tasks from a legal and compliance standpoint. So what they are and when in that new hire process um, they should be completed. And just a couple of housekeeping items too. Um, this presentation is going to be recorded. So um, if it's something you want to access later or somebody else in your office maybe you think would benefit from it, um, <clears throat> we will be recording the presentation and posting this on our website. The last slide has our web address. Um, I'll be sending out the slides uh, and where to access the webinar after today. Um, we are going to try to keep these on a little bit of a shorter side of an hour, um, but depending on the number of questions and how much I'm loving hearing myself talk, because let's be honest, uh, if the only thing that most lawyers like more than that is billing uh, somebody to listen to ourselves talk. So, um, you know, depending on that, uh, I'm hoping to stay less than an hour. I, I know people are very busy, um, but, you know, I don't want to give short shrift to the topic or questions if people have um, questions. And along those lines, um, there is a question box. Feel free to um, type those if it's Something that is, uh, I think should be addressed at the, that moment I will break in and address the question. Otherwise, I will, um, hold off on those at, until the end. Um, I always do a print typed up Q&A. So any questions that come in, I will try to capture those and write up a quick answer and again, send those to all of the attendees so you um, have that if you have to jump off uh, the call for any reason toward the end. And then another goal of mine for our monthly webinars is going to be giving everybody something you can take away. Um, some months it might be more, uh, you know, <laughs> nebulous than uh, a document or something like that. But this month, um, what I'll be <clears throat> distributing is a handy onboarding checklist. This will be something that you can keep electronically. You can print out and, you know, post to a, a board, uh, you can, however you want, that makes most sense for you, but I will be distributing an onboarding checklist that we uh, created as well. So um, with that, I'm just going to jump right into the content here. So <clears throat> the due diligence phase is what we kind of call all of the tasks 
that need to be completed after the conditional offer of employment is made. Now, before, you know, just right after the interview phase, um, you really shouldn't be doing any of this kind of due diligence. All of it should wait until you have made an offer of employment to that particular applicant. Once you've made that offer, then we recommend you go through the process of doing your due diligence as needed. Um, <clears throat> I always like to give a story to sort of illustrate my point because uh, the bullet points are great, but um, you know, if this story doesn't hit home, um, I don't really know what will. So this is a very uh, an interesting story about why you should do your due diligence. So a company uh, that will not be named had uh, brought in somebody that they thought, you know, was a very high caliber, high performing employee. Um, they had started other companies in the past and we're coming in for a fairly high level role within this company. So the company executives uh, in all their infinite wisdom decided, you know, we'll run a background check, but let's let them start. There's pos not possibly anything that could show up, right? <clears throat> well, of course, because this is how this works, um, a, the background check did come back and this employee who they thought was going to be this fabulous, wonderful, amazing employee actually had been convicted of murder. This is not a fake story. Um, so HR had to then decide, okay, well, we can't let him work here. He's been convicted of murder and lied apparently about starting all of these other companies. <clears throat> so then they're faced with a safety issue about how to now go in and terminate this person who had already started working, had access to the building, had access to the IT and computers and what have you. <clears throat> so had they waited and done their due diligence and done the background check and waited for that to clear before letting that person start working, um, if, you know, it wouldn't have been such an issue. They wouldn't have had to have scaled, you know, figure out how to safely terminate this person and get the security badge back and all of that. So doing due diligence, highly, highly recommended. Um, you know, one of the things that most companies do is a background check. And, you know, one thing that you kind of want to be aware of with the background checks is all of the state law variances, because in many states, probably most states, you can, an employer, for example, cannot consider arrest that did not result in a conviction. Um, California, you cannot consider a marijuana charge that's older than two years old. Um, as far as credit checks, now certain employees, of course, it makes great sense to run a credit check on some employees. If they're going to have access to funds, if they're <clears throat> in accounting, accounts receivable, um, a controller, you know, you want to make sure that you're running a credit check on those types of employees. <clears throat> but there are many states where you can only run a credit check on people who are going to hold certain positions. So before you decide what types of background checks you're going to be doing, make sure you know that legally they are something you can do in both the state and city that you're in, but also for depending on the position. Sorry about that, I've got a little bit of a cold here hanging on. Uh, so in addition to background checks, a lot of companies are doing drug testing. Um, and this is certainly something that if you are an airline or a railroad and you're governed by the FAA or the Department of Transportation, <clears throat> you're going to be required to do drug testing. It's going to spell out what types of drugs you have to drug test for, um, very specific protocol for that. But if you are a private employer and you're not governed by any of those other federal laws, you know, some companies are having to think about, does this actually make sense for our company to be doing drug testing? Or 
does it make sense to test for drugs but not marijuana? Um, with the expansion of medical and recreational marijuana, you know, there very well could be positions out there, you know, maybe it's somebody who's an administrative assistant or a receptionist or, <clears throat> you know, they don't have, they're not driving, they're not driving a forklift, certainly. Um, <clears throat> but maybe it's just not, uh, if they're using marijuana recreational, but they're not under the influence of it at work, you know, doing that cost benefit analysis of whether drug testing is even makes sense with your your workforce or the position that you're hiring for, that is something to consider um, whether you'll be doing that at all. Another type of, you know, sort of due diligence is medical testing. This is a very sticky area. So you've got to make sure if you're going to require medical testing, if you're going to have somebody go in and, you know, make sure that they can lift 50 pounds or, uh, you know, stand on their feet or, you know, any number of medical testing that you can kind of envision. Um, if you're going to require that, you should require that for every single person that's in that role. Excuse me. Sorry about that. I'm just kind of losing my voice here. <clears throat> um, you have to require that for everybody in that role. So you can't have somebody come in and say, um, you know, oh, I, I have this disability, or um, you can't look at somebody and wonder if they do, and so then require just that one person to go in and get medical testing. Uh, you're going to violate the Americans with Disabilities Act if you do that. So you do need to make sure that if it's a physical role, consider establishing that policy ahead of time to say that everybody in this role needs to get medical testing um, and establish that protocol right away and then make sure that you know you're having them sign off on a waiver and your any medical information that you get back is is very um, securely filed and kept separate from other personnel files but um, medical testing can be a little bit of a sticky area so just require it for all or don't do it at all and then the last point I want to make is Get the offer letter signed. So if you've made an offer of employment, um, not everybody uses an offer letter, but we here definitely recommend that companies do use these. Um, it standardizes all of the due diligence, ta due diligence tasks that you're going to complete. It'll say that they're, they're, you know, they're subject to a background check. They're subject to drug testing. They have to show that they're authorized to work in the U.S. Um, you know, through the uh, Form I-9. So there's, uh, it's a nice way to standardize all of the, the background checking that you're going to be doing, but then it also clarifies and lays out a lot of the important aspects of the job, like a start date, the pay, what the role will be, um, you know, because I can't tell you how many times there are misunderstandings about pay or what the role will be. You know, maybe the person doing the interview said a certain number and it wasn't communicated to the management team who or HR who's sending out the offer. And you get an employee come in and they get, you know, a few paychecks and they're like, hey, hey, I think I thought I was supposed to be making, you know, $45,000 a year and, and this isn't what I what I expected. It really clearly lays out those expectations. And then we recommend attaching a job description to that too. So they know the essential functions of the job. And essentially what you're doing is you're making sure you have really clear documentation in place at the very beginning. So those are all of the tasks we recommend that you complete after you've made an offer of employment, but before the hire date, the first date of working. Now, this is, the uh, obviously the tasks that should be completed on or very very near the first day I if you can get these done the first day or within the first couple of days definitely best practice I know it's a lot of information to have to go through and you're going to be papering your new hire but that's to be expected that's kind of what happens when you um, you know come on board so 
you will want to make sure that you, if you are, don't have an employee contact form, um, definitely this is something we have in-house. You can let us know, and I'm happy to send you one. But you want to make sure that you're getting their address, contact information, an emergency contact, just sort of that general information. Make sure you don't ask illegal questions on that form. Don't ask about kids or spouse or anything like that. Ask about their information and emergency contact. Um, but that's important to have on file. You'll want to get them the W-4 for their um, federal tax withholdings, um, state and local tax withholding forms on um, some states and some localities, New York City, uh, for example, have their own sort of local taxes. So, you know, knowing if they're needed is one thing, but making sure that your employees are actually filling them out. This is a step that I think a lot of employers miss. Um, so making sure that those withholding forms for any state and local taxes are also completed. Um, you want the employee to complete section one of the form I-9. Again, this is the uh, form that shows that that employee is authorized to work in the US. Um, and that can be filled out on that very first date of hire. And I want to stress, it has to be the very first date of hire because you only have a three-day turnaround on this document um, before it's overdue, essentially. So um, have them fill out section one, uh, either on the date of hire, you could have them fill it out before they come in for their first day as long as the employee has accepted your offer of employment. So don't do that, don't give them that form until they've accepted the offer. I have had some clients tell me that they do that right away at the interview phase. That is not the proper way to do that and could give rise to nationality or citizenship discrimination issues. So wait until you have, they have accepted that offer. And another point, this is not an I-9 presentation, but make sure employees are choosing which documents to provide. Um, don't tell them they need to provide you with this document or that document. You can't require a social security card, for example. So make sure they're choosing which documents they give you when they complete section one. Um, employment contracts, I include this in here more as a caveat not to use an employment contract, um, we rarely recommend them. And these are really for an employee that you want to lock into a guaranteed employment period. But it's very rare that I can envision a situation where a company would want to do that. You're going to ruin the at-will employment uh, status of that employee, meaning you're only going to be able to terminate that employee for cause, and that's going to have to be spelled out in the contract. You know, uh, what is considered cause in order to terminate an employee who's got a guaranteed contract for a term of a year or however long. So if you use an employment contract, maybe for a very high level employee, um, you'd want to get that signed ASAP and um, definitely have an attorney look it over to make sure that you're thinking through how to spell out those cause issues. Um, the employee handbook and acknowledgement. It can be tempting to say, here's a handbook, read it at your leisure, give us this acknowledgement back um, when you have some time. Um, I'm going to tell you, I know most employees don't read a full employee handbook. Um, ours that we draft here at MyHR Council, they're about 45 pages long, so we get it. But um, giving it to the employee with the specific uh, you know, directive that they are to acknowledge that they've received and reviewed the handbook and understand it, getting that signed, whether that's e-signed, docu-sign, signed on a piece of paper, hugely important because that employee handbook likely contains your sexual harassment prevention policy, your anti-discrimination and harassment policy, and other very important pieces that an employee needs to sign off and acknowledge that they have reviewed, they understand, and you have that piece of paper then that says, no, we, are, we do not per permit and we expressly prohibit sexual harassment the employee knew about it, they signed this, here it is. It's a great 
start to a defense, essentially. So making sure they get that employee handbook <clears throat> with the express you know, directive to read, review, sign off, hugely important. Um, <clears throat> I would also recommend providing any other standalone policies that you might have. I've seen standalone IT security policies because maybe you work with a security company and they have a specific policy they want your employees to sign. Um, company vehicle policies, if you're going to be providing a company vehicle, um, making sure that they know if it is or isn't for personal use, um, how they get reimbursed for gas and mileage, um, you know, so company vehicle policy, a business expense reimbursement policy. These can be worked into the handbook, but um, sometimes there's the standalone policies that employers will provide. So make sure that you're distributing those and um, getting sign off on those as well. The other, um, so restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants are better known as non-competes, but they often have a number of other components to those. Um, non-compete, non-solicitation of either employees or clients, um, confidentiality provisions, non-disparagement provisions saying don't go out and badmouth our company. Um, have these signed right away if you are using them because a lot of states require that an employer provide what's called additional consideration when an employee signs a midstream restrictive covenant. So all of that is fancy <laughs> lawyer language to say, have an employee sign a non-compete right away. Because if it's a few months, six months, a year down the road, and you want to then have that existing employee sign a new or first non-compete, non-solicitation, or confidentiality agreement, you're going to have to pay them a bonus, a lump sum, give them a raise, give them a promotion. You're going to have to give them some sort of perk to sign that. Whereas if you have them sign that on the first day, that promise of employment is considered sufficient in all states. And so that's a hugely, it's hugely important that if you are using those, you do that right away. And, uh, you know, just remember, non-competes, they're not allowed in all jurisdictions, and they're certainly not favored. California doesn't allow them at all, with the exception, very few um, tiny little exceptions to that. Illinois, you can only enforce a non-compete against an employee that makes more than $13 an hour. So keep in mind that non-competes are not allowed in some jurisdictions, not allowed for some employees in certain jurisdictions, and a lot of states don't favor them. You're more likely to be protected by a non-solicitation agreement that says your employees, uh, if they leave, they can't poach your current employees. They can't use your client list and take your customers or clients away from you. And then confidentiality agreements. So a lot of times we're not even recommending, recommending that most employees get a non-compete. So again, tangent, something we can discuss with you if you have questions about that. But um, make sure that they're set up on payroll. So whether that's direct deposit, paycheck, uh, payroll card, a lot of industries use payroll cards. Um, make sure you know what the laws are in your state as to whether you need to get um, authorization. So some states say that you cannot do, uh, you can't just automatically force an employee to use direct deposit. Some states require that an employee give consent before you set that up. Um, you almost always, in any state, if they allow um, direct deposit, you have to let them choose the bank where the deposit will go. Um, payroll cards, those have a litany of rules. And unfortunately, yes, they are different depending on what state you're in um, as far as, you know, consent, um, bank accounts, being able to withdraw money for free. Um, so there's a lot of uh, nuance to setting somebody up for payroll. but um, just kind of an overview there as well. 
Um, <clears throat> have If you have more than 100 employees, you want to make sure that you're complying with the equal employment opportunity rules and getting them to self-identify for your EEO-1 reporting uh, requirements if you have 100 or more employees. Again, a reminder, this is voluntary. So this is a form that you give your employees that asks that they identify their race and their gender. And in some situations, if you're, uh, you have an affirmative action um, requirements, you know, veteran status and, and those sorts of things, um, if an employee that you've hired refuses to identify their race or their gender, um, you have to, as the employer, I know this is a really icky thing for some people to have to think about doing, but if your employee refuses or will not identify race or gender, you've got to use anything else that you have at your disposal to try to identify them, whether that's their appearance or, um, you know, information they might give you on the I-9, um, other documents they've filled out maybe where they have chosen male or female. Um, you also have issues as far as, um, you know, non-binary transgender individuals where there's only male and female categories. So this is, can become a tricky issue, but uh, giving that self-identification form, letting them know that it's voluntary and cross your fingers that they fill it out, uh, that's definitely the easiest uh, situation there. <clears throat> and then the last, um, employee benefit enrollment forms. So not everybody offers uh, benefits right away. So this may or may not apply to you. Um, if you are not offering health insurance, for example, until later, make sure you've got like a, a tracking system or a tickler system of some sort so that you don't miss those ACA deadlines for when a new employee has to be enrolled in your health insurance. So um, that's very important. We do have a question here. <clears throat> so the question is, what is the number of employees regarding self-identification? So that's for the EEO-1, and that applies to employers that have 100 or more employees. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so there's only one task to complete on the third day after the start date. So while this might look like your rest date, it doesn't mean it's an easy day. And when you have an employee in the same town as you, this is not a big deal, right? Your employee, they gave you, you know, the documents, you looked at them on the first day, they filled it out you fill it out, you probably got it done right away, and, and you're not even, you don't even have a third day. You're on vacation this day because you don't have anything to do here. The problem becomes when you have remote hires. And the <clears throat> USCIS, the laws here, do not give remote employers a break on the Section 2 requirements. So as a reminder, Employers are expected to verify employment and eligibility, so authorization to work in the U.S., by reviewing original documents, so not scanned documents, and they have to review them in person with the employee and then complete Section 2 by within three business days of that new hire start date. There's no exception for remote hires. So you can imagine if you're hiring somebody you know, I'm in Minneapolis, we're hiring somebody in Idaho, uh, I, how am I going to do this? And uh, you got to, you know, think through your process, have something ready. There are solutions to this. There's, you know, remote notary networks um, that, you know, maybe you can call up a, a local bank that has a notary that's willing to look at the documents and attest that they have viewed the documents with the employee, they find them to be, you know, credible looking, and then they overnight you that packet so you have it for the third day. It could be local office, branch, it could be a family member. This is a big misconception about the I-9, but if, uh, if 
I'm getting hired. My husband technically could attest to my documentation on the I-9. Uh, not probably uh, best practice and probably not something you want to rely on, but it cannot be somebody remote looking at scan documents and signing off on that. And here's why. Uh, if you read section two of the I-9 form, you are attesting under penalty of perjury that you have witnessed the documents with the employee present and you're signing it. If you have not actually done that, you it's fraud and there are criminal penalties in addition to civil fines. So it's a really, like I said, it's a rest day. There's one thing here, but it doesn't mean it's an easy day. So just again, this is not an I-9 seminar, but I want to reiterate that because we do get that question a lot. Great question here. Can you Skype for reviewing those documents? I wish you could. I really do, but you can't. They have to be in person. Um, you can't use Zoom. You can't use video conferencing. You can't use Skype. It's got to be somebody who's actually physically handling the documents. And I know that that's it's kind of brutal. So. Um, if you have more questions about that, you know, certainly we have partners that we work with that have remote I-9 um, services, so let me know after the fact if you have any questions on that. All right, training. Um, so this is not just so you know, this is not a, an exhaustive list of training. These are what I see as um, trainings, the first couple, of course, trainings that every single employee should get, whether you're in a state that requires it or not. The others are required for certain industries. Um, and I do recommend IT and data security training. So training to complete in the first 30 days, if possible, You've got a new employee, you've got a captive audience. If you can do the training and onboarding right away, definitely that is the best practice. Um, so sexual harassment prevention training, we all know, we've all heard it, the Me Too movement, all, you know, all of the sexual harassment allegations that are coming forward. But what a lot of people fail to realize is that the number of sexual harassment complaints that are made to the EEOC and other state agencies have skyrocketed. Um, there's a real lens on this issue right now. And so California, New York, <clears throat> both of those are states that have passed mandated sexual harassment prevention training. In California, for example, all employers that have more than five employees have to give their non-supervisory employees one hour of sexual harassment prevention training, and uh, supervisors need to get two hours. And the training requirements, which um, we do provide that training, but the training requirements, they require that it be interactive, that there be examples. There are a lot of very um, specific requirements for what that training actually has to look like. So just know it is required in some jurisdictions, but definitely recommended in all. Um, Non-discrimination and anti-retaliation training. There's no jurisdiction that I'm aware of that requires it, but obviously um, it would behoove an employer to make sure that employees know what is discriminatory behavior and making sure that retaliation is, not, you know, is absolutely prohibited uh, in the workplace. IT and data security. Um, this is an issue near and dear to my heart. Um, we obviously, as an online on-demand law firm, we have an ask an attorney portal and our, our clients submit sensitive data through that portal to us to review and answering um, their questions. We have very seriously, we take very seriously data and IT security. We have um, a number of protocol in place through a security company to make sure that data is protected. But that's not just a, a, something attorneys or banks need to worry about. Um, there's, in last year, there was a spate of um, spoof emails going around that were saying things like, oh, send us all of your employees' 
you know, W-2s for, I can't remember the specifics, but a lot of companies thought that it was legitimate. And so they sent out W-2s for their employees that contain social security numbers. And employers can get in trouble if that data is breached, is hacked. Um, so you have to make sure that no matter who you are, whether it's just lock your computer when you leave your desk for lunch, don't make it your password, password one, two, three. It doesn't have to be, you know, crazy technical training, but it, there should be some IT data security training that takes place. Obviously, HIPAA training is if you're a covered entity, if you're a hospital, a clinic, um, an insurance company, in some situations, not all insurance companies are covered entities, um, but there could be a situation, if you are a covered entity for HIPAA purposes, um, each new member of the workforce has to be given HIPAA training within a reasonable time frame. It doesn't say the first 30 days, but again, it's highly recommended. They're in training mode anyway. Just get it done because that HIPAA training can is complicated. Um, you know, you've got to give information about patients' rights, how to safeguard protected health information, why HIPAA is important. So there's a lot that goes into HIPAA training. Um, OSHA training, safety training um, as needed. Some industries are required to give different components of OSHA training, but you know your OSHA and safety training could be as simple as fire, prote prior fire prevention plans, emergency exit plans, personal protective equipment. You know, do you need to wear steel toe boots and goggles? You know, the training doesn't have to be um, what to do if you're in underwater welder, uh, you know, it could be just as simple as what type of protective equipment are you needing? And hazmat training, obviously not incredibly uh, widespread is people who transport hazardous materials must receive hazmat training. But again, it was one of those that I was like, well, this is a actually required training. So I added it to the list here. Got another question. I will address that one later. <clears throat> okay, and then the last component here that I wanna talk about is supervisor training. Um, obviously, sexual harassment prevention training and non-discrimination and anti-retaliation training, that's required for all. Um, but I highly, highly, highly recommend that you train your frontline managers on these three areas at a minimum. Uh, first being the Fair Labor Standards Act, so the FLSA. That governs minimum wage, other wage and hour issues like compensable time, break time, clocking in and out, um, exempt, non-exempt, all of those sorts of things. Um, just a real quick explanation of why that's important. Um, I read maybe a week or so ago now, a company was fined in excess of $500,000 because they had a frontline manager who interviewed, made the offer, and set up all the payroll information for an employee. And they hired that employee and said, you're exempt. Um, they wanted to say that they were exempt under the administrative exemption. So if you're familiar with the exemptions, it's complicated, but essentially they brought in this person to say, you know, you're, ex you're exempt. And this employee was not exempt. They should have been paid hourly and they should have gotten overtime. That manager did not know anything about the Fair Labor Standards Act, but it doesn't matter. The court still imputed that damages calculation against the whole company. So unfortunately, your frontline managers can kind of get you in a lot of trouble. So making sure that they at least have a very base knowledge of what the Fair Labor Standards Act is, about wage an hour, about break times, about nursing mother breaks, um, whether they're paid or unpaid, um, clocking in and out, clocking out late, clocking in early, um, and keeping track of that time. That's very, very important training. So make sure that um, you're offering something like that to your frontline managers. Uh, performance management training is really important. So knowing, you know, what uh, what rules there are, what work rules there are, 
how to do a verbal coaching session, how to do a, a write-up, how to um, do a you know performance improvement plan, a PIP, and make sure that they know how to document all of that so that if you do have to let a problem employee go down the road, you've got a really nice uh, history of documentation in place to show that you know these are the reasons, these are the issues we had, they were not improving, and therefore we terminated. That will go a very long ways to making sure that if you do get sued or you do have a complaint alleged, you've got a nice packet of information that you send to your friendly uh, employment law attorney, and that attorney can turn around and say, nope, uh, you know, this claim is not warranted, motion to dismiss, what have you. <clears throat> And then the last training that I recommend for supervisors is leave of absence management. <clears throat> quick story, not too long of a story, but quick story. Um, <clears throat> a case, again, that I read, this one's a little older, a few months ago, but a frontline manager was told by the employee that they needed to go have surgery. Uh, they broke, tore their uh, rotator cuff. And so the manager's like, okay, great, take the leave. That's awesome. Uh, heal quickly and we'll see in four weeks. Except they didn't go through the FMLA process. This employer was governed by FMLA. The employee clearly put the employer on notice that there was an FMLA qualifying event. They missed all of their you know, documentation uh, requirements along the way. And then when the employee came back later and said, oh, I'm still struggling, the employer said, uh, I mean, you were already out for four weeks. Not nah, sorry. You got to come back to work or we're going to let you go. Well, FMLA gives you 12 weeks of time. So he filed an FMLA interference claim and was successful against uh, this company. So letting your managers know when they should be triggered to know something might be FMLA leave or, you know, if your company has, um, you know, bereavement leave, that's optional. Let, you know, let them know what types of leave your state requires and then what types of leave your company provides and then make sure that they know what those are, the trigger words, and then what to do with that information, which usually I would say just go back to HR and uh, have one central person, you know, navigating all those leave issues. But um, those are the trainings that I recommend that supervisors receive, hopefully in the first 30 days, if possible. Okay, so it looks like I've got a couple more questions here. Um, I've got a question about um, third, if there's any third-party vendors that offer these trainings virtually, um, and I'm assuming this is as far as um, sexual harassment training goes. Um, and I mean, I, there are companies out there that do offer those. Um, I'm not familiar enough with any. I mean, we do them. Um, Internally here, of course, uh, we provide training, but as far as, you know, a vendor, I'm not sure of any offhand. Um, webinar title idea, what is this? Triple Tuesday Takedown. That is awesome. I love it. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, do you have contacts for local state assistance to set up a training seminar for on-site? Okay, so this is another training question about sexual harassment. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a specific um, I don't have a specific vendor in mind that I would recommend. Let's see. Okay, so I've got another question about onboarding and the medical testing. As far as the waiver, um, do we have a sample of it? Yes, we do. Um, we've got a, uh, I believe it's on our compliance website. <clears throat> if it is not, it's something that I will include in the email with the HRCI credit code, the onboarding checklist and all of that. 
And no, you cannot, and the uh, second part of the question is, does it include any previous workers' compensation accidents? So no, and you cannot ask about whether an employee has been involved or suffered any previous workers' compensation accidents, and I wouldn't recommend it anyway, because if you ask that and they say yes, and then you don't hire them because you're worried they're a work comp. All they do is they file work comp claims and then you don't hire them because of that. Uh, <clears throat> you've got a retaliation issue. All right, I don't have any other questions here um, and I'm glad we got in uh, 45 minutes here. So. Um, I'm going to give a couple more minutes if anybody else has any other last burning questions um, for me. I would be happy to address those. And I'll hit the last slide here so you can see our contact information. That MyHRCouncilCompliance.com website, anybody can go to that and access that. We've got hundreds of free forms, checklists. FAQs, um, and I believe that that medical um, testing waiver is on the website. Like I said, if it is not, it is something I will send out because we do have one. Okay, so another question I got was, does my HR offer the manager trainings you were referring to that should be completed within the first 30 days? Great question, thank you. We do. On our Solution Center, which is at myhrcouncilcompliance.com, under the um, HR Solutions tab and then under Trainings, we have pre-recorded presentations that you could show your supervisors um, that would address the FLSA leave and performance management. So those are available. Um, online for any of our uh, premium sub subscribers. So if you're signed up for our MyHR Council um, service, you will have access to that. We also do have sexual harassment training, um, but I will say it is not going to meet the requirements for California um, because those requirements are new and uh, they do require that it be interactive. So that doesn't really lend itself to a pre-recorded online training, um, but uh, to the person who asks this question, please contact us directly and I'd be happy to chat with you about that. All right, well, I don't have any more questions here, so I will, like I said, type up a Q&A so everybody can access this. I will be sending out the HRCI credit. I'll be sending out a the presentation, and what else did I promise I would send? Uh, everything I said I would send in the beginning, I will be sending out. Um, it probably won't be today, but likely tomorrow. If you have questions in the meantime, feel free to contact us here. And I hope everybody has a great day. And I hope to see you for our Triple Tuesday takedown in February. Have a great day, everybody.